all these experiments, different acronyms, are only after one thing. That is R. So R is the tensor to scalar ratio, measuring the amplitude of the uh, gravitational wave with respect to uh, scalar perturbation. And they all look like this. Okay? This is an extremely focused, a big gamble, if you will, for multiple groups. So the first experiment in this series, Vice of One, uses uh, more conventional fee horn couple detectors, hand assembled by grad students. I'll show some pictures. Uh, but later on, Vice of Two, Kekere, and Vice of Three uses uh, is a graphic um, planar antennas that look like this. There's scale there, three millimeters. So what you're looking at are vertical and horizontal slots. After all, this is a polarization experiment, right? Um, and the voltage difference generated by incident microwave, okay, was collected by this meandering summing tree coherently and then sent to a unchip filter and then that power is dumped onto a thermally isolated thermometer. Okay, so these are, these are thin legs. Okay, and the thermometer or the thermometer heats up as you scan back and forth. And if you do the subtraction, there's another detector here collecting the horizontal polarization. I don't remember which one goes to where, even though I designed it. Um, but you know the idea. You take the different, the two detectors, you scan, and you do complicated math to form the map. So the nice thing is, this is all completely lithographic. You can make lots and lots of detectors. So this is my notebook <laughs> when I first realized this can be done back in uh, 2006 um, when we were developing bicep two detectors when bicep one is still running. So like I said, it's a very, very focused program, even though Bison 1 is still just started observing, you know, we're already developing technology for Bison 2 and so on. And this is very hard work, so I have to motivate myself by thinking about inflation all the time. Well, I was calculating the impedance of these microstruments. So the detector looks like this, so the microwave coming from the telescope uh, and that, the, that complicated antenna gets sent uh, to this island. This is just black, it's just empty space, so this is uh, really thermally isolated uh, from the bath, okay? So this thing heats up, but not, not here, not this part, okay? So this is a very sensitive thermometer. And that wave is converted to heat in here because this is a lossy resistor, if you will, and it heats up, and there is a superconducting uh, thin film of the thermometer located here to detect, to convert the heat signal into a current signal. And the reason to use superconductor is that it's a very sensitive thermometer. If you change the temperature slightly, the resistance changes a lot. Okay. And um, here's a gorgeous picture of a uh, bicep two focal plane under the microscope showing the bolometer and the slots and that crazy summing tree. And uh, after that development, uh, for the past eight years, we fabricated more than 100 tiles of, of the, these things, all looking for gravitation. So this is the first generation bicycle one, focal plane, like I said, all hand assembled by a grad student. And um, after we've gone to different graphic detectors, we can pack a lot more of them. So, uh, so bicep two was 10 times faster uh, in sensitivity to R than uh, bicep one. And now bicep three will be 10 times faster than bicep two. Um, and we will really be able to be able be able to follow up on bicep results with bicep three. So 
size of the collaboration. It's not, you know, very small, but it's not very big either. So your voice can be heard. We have good ideas, can be implemented, can be respected. Um, so it's a very good size collaboration. I really enjoyed it. Lots of talented people. So what the work is like at the South Pole? Um, lab, it's very well maintained facility. Room temperature. Um, Tell um, in the lab. Outside it's cold, uh, but again, do most of the lab work uh, at room temperature. A pair of hands showing the size of a uh, device of tube type uh, receiver. <clears throat> Not very big, but with lots of detectors, very sensitive. So, not only is our program very focused but also our telescope, okay? So it goes on and on. So BICEP1 did this for three years, then BICEP2 did this for another three years, and what you're looking at is Keck, which is an array of BICEP2 type receivers, and it's, done, it's been doing this for her since 2011, so two and a half years. Scanning back and forth, taking the difference between two polarizations, making a map. And that little funny thing you probably noticed was a calibration. Oh, there we go. <laughs> because the atmosphere is not polarized, so you do a little dip and you use that to uh, calibrate the gain of two polarization states. This will get boring. <laughs> That's the point. We're all very focused. So this is uh, bicep two data. The Q map, U map, and this is the depth measure in nano Kelvin. Now it's going to second year. And you start to see pattern in QMAP and UMAP. In QMAP, you see these uh, plus patterns, and in UMAP, you see these cross patterns because the polarization state is uh, dominated by the emo polarization. Okay. And you to take, um, this is what we call jackknife tests. So you take the first half of Q and you subtract it. The second half of Q from it, you get the difference. Um, and you should see nothing except the noise, and that's what we did. So we, we just saw you know, this, this jackknife map, so it's just consistent with noise, and uh, there's a real signal emerging from uh, the unjackknife uh, maps. So if you use polarization vectors, um, and this is what we got after three years, so there's definitely polarization detected. Device of two field, and it's most like E mode if you remember the definition of E being radial pattern or circular pattern around a point, right? So you don't see, you know, there's no big curl jumping at you uh, with this map. <clears throat> Again, so the scale of this is uh, 1.7 microkelvin, that's tiny compared to 3 Kelvin of microwave. Uh, of CMB, of micro background temperature, and uh, 30 Kelvin of our total instrument loading, including, including the atmosphere. Okay, so it's mostly emo. Remember this circular pattern around it? So if you use a nice mathematical trick uh, that involves linear algebra uh, by solving a gigantic eigenvalue problem, you can get rid of all the, the E mode and leaving only B mode. Okay, so from here to here is a matrix operation that I learned from this electric architecture 20 years ago. Um, so I did learn something. <laughs> Alright, so if you zoom in, Okay, 
this and this are the same thing, just different scale. I just blew up the, the scale by a factor of seven or something, six. And this is all curl, because by definition, after that matrix operation, there is only curl left. Okay, so it's not a big surprise that you don't use curl. But the nice thing is, the noise level is way below this level. Okay. Even if you operate noise map, even if you use matrix operation on the noise, completely noise map, you can get completely curl, only curl out of it. But the nice thing is our noise level is way below this level. Okay, so if you show, if you had a, um, a simulation with noise level consistent with our map, um, the level is way smaller. So we believe nearly all of this is real on the sky. So if you plot the scalar of that curl mode or B mode, you get something like So if you turn this into a spectrum, into a power spectrum, okay, um, it's just a measurement of amplitude versus angular scale. This way being small angular scale, that way it's lar large angular scale. This is about one degree, about two degrees. Okay. So the solid points were the bicep two points. Okay. Air bar very small compared to the detected signal. So again, we believe nearly all of this is real on the sky. And when you do a jackknife, meaning when you split the data, split the data in two halves and you take the difference, no matter how you split the data, in time, in different observation angle, you know, the, the telescope was doing you know this scan and you, you form a map from left going scan versus right going scans. However you do it, the signal is gone, okay? So if there's semantics, um, you expect some of these jackknives will fail. But we found nothing. So we're really convinced this signal is on the sky. So we came up with 14 different jackknives and all of them passed the consistency check. So that took a year. So when this first showed up, I mean, there's no way this is real on the sky, come on. But then, you know, we exhausted all the possibilities we have to publish, and we believe this signal is really on the sky. And after, you know, we've done that, we compare the bicep two data in solid points with Keck data, cross-correlate with bicep two, and also with bicep one data, cross-correlate with bicep two. So remember, bicep one was the previous generation, and Keck was the next generation, which was a copy of Bicep 2. Um, and again, we pretty much saw the same thing, you know, with some fluctuation. Okay. But the important message is we've seen something, and if you plot a inflationary uh, curve plus uh, lensing generated V mode, and it's an excellent fit to the data. Right. So these are the different uh, consistency jackknives tests we've done. Uh, this is a, yeah, a whole year of work. We're trying to be very creative in how we split the data. So the most challenging jackknife was uh, was done with different what we call boresight rotations. So our telescopes are small, I mean, in this case, the Bicep 2 telescope is very small, so we can afford to uh, rotate the entire instrument. And you know, if there's any systematic effect in your instrument, it rotates with the telescope, but the sky signal remains the same. So it's a very tough test to pass, and yet we, we pass that. We have different uh, foresight rotations. Jackknife tests, and we all, we all pass that. So again, we're really confident that there's no way this is uh, related to the, the instrument itself. <clears throat> How about astronomical foreground? You have to look through the galaxy after all to see the uh, microwave background. 
So we have some uh, color information, but the main message is it's really unlikely that the level of the signal we observe can be explained by um, program, um, most likely uh, dust. That's what the dominant program at our frequency. So the level of dust, bus, dust polarization has to be huge in order to explain our data, which gets really unphysical. Okay. So we think the level of dust contamination is around 10% or smaller than the level we detected. So if you add the sample variance, which is coming from the back, we only measure a few modes in our map. Um, this is our bottom line um, power spectrum plot. So the air bars are kind of big, but these are all sample variance limited. Um, so strength theorists, they, don't, they only care about this plot. They, you, know, you can wake up now. <laughs> So we detected a largish uh, tensor to scale ratio, <clears throat> uh, 0.2 uh, with some error dominated by uncertainty dominated by um, the sample variance. But the main message is the uh, null model, null hypothesis is ruled out at very high significance. So the likelihood is vanishingly small at zero. It's not 100% certain that all of this is, uh, is tensor. Maybe a small part of it is coming from foreground or not, or not. but um, we, don't, we don't think so. We think the dominant signal is really um, the simplest explanation is uh, it's coming from uh, um, audio beam modes, which provides an excellent fit our data. These are prior experiments, all trying to do the same thing. This is the gravitational lensing contribution. Alright. So, before we published, there was uh, upper limits coming from uh, indirect uh, measurement with uh, temperature fluctuation temperature and isotropy <clears throat> from Planck, WMAP, in combination with uh, ground-based experiments like ACT and SPT, and the expected um, range of tensor is given by these curves, these contours, and this is what we found. So people make a big deal out of the apparent tension, but it's really a three sigma level, um, and that will probably go away. Remember, we are still limited by simple areas, so I wouldn't be shocked if it ended up being here or here. And, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with Plunk, uh, but uh, it's, it's recent attention. It will be really interesting if, you know, after a few years when we shrink the air bar, it comes out to be here, then tension it becomes real and hard to, then you have to come up with an explanation why um, there is a tension, but so far it's only three sigma. So the main message is, again, these models were ruled out, these low R models were ruled out with high significance, so, and many of these models were motivated, motivated by string theories. So implications, if, if our interpretation is correct that the PMO we observe is dominated by gravitational wave uh, primordial PMO. Then these are the implications. So, inflation happened, gravity is quantized, and inflation happened at the grand unification scale, and chaotic inflation models with polynomial type um, potential are favored. And many string motivated models have been ruled out. And many were pretty good looking uh, models. And uh, also, the inflation field has to move, or the inflaton has to move over uh, super Planckian range. 
and the implication is it needs um, symmetry um, in the ultimately unified quantum gravity theory. So the three theorists are very excited about this. There are lots of lots of other implications. For example, half of the axion dark matter parameter space is ruled out, and many more. Okay. From what I heard, it takes a few years to sort out the theoretical implications of this uh, discovery. All right. So we've gone too fast, almost, because uh, we built biceps one, and we observed three years, and then we did develop technology for later generation. Um, and the first experiment of that generation discovered BMO, while the later generations have been funded and built. So we're in excellent shape to follow up this, uh, this, uh, this signal, really, and to shrink the error bar of it. <clears throat> and after we publish our data, we really realize we're, we're really far ahead of our competitors. So the latest upgrade of this program is called BICEP3, which is being built by my group at Stanford primarily. Uh, it'll, it'll just add another um, 2,000 plus detectors at a different frequency than BICEP2. And it'll cover more sky with extended uh, frequency coverage. Um, we can really uh, conclusively say this is cosmological and um, with uh, reduced error bars. So what uh, what was the technology development that made BICEP3 possible? Well, BICEP3 was a, a, a telescope that's twice as big in aperture as BICEP2, and that creates all sorts of cryogenic challenges um, by a factor of four, basically, because the window size is much bigger, you know, and if you just use the same window, it implodes under vacuum, and the amount of ambient radiation coming in, you know, it's quadruple because of the aperture, so you have to reject more of it. <laughs> but we overcame all that challenges, and uh, BICEP3 is on schedule, on schedule to deploy later this year to start at least two years of observation also from the South Pole. So this is the infrared filter we de developed for BICEP3. I can explain what's going on here. Uh, we're doing all sorts of fun things with uh, technology, um, kind of low tech compared to the, <laughs> the lithographic detectors. I can pay more. This is uh, the lens material. It's uh, high density alumina um, ceramic. Um, it looks opaque in optical, but it's completely transparent in microwave. It's a good thing. Um, it has high index of refraction, and you have to anti reflection coat it. And the material that you use for anti reflection coating has different um, coefficients for thermal expansion. So you have to dice it using high power laser. Okay, so it goes on and on. But very fun, very interesting projects. And we, for some reason, I think we use more physics than high energy physics. This is, uh, you have to know thermal dynamics, you have to know <laughs> mechanics. You have to under understand resonances, ENM, optics, not just mathematics. <laughs> I think it's been. What happens after bicep two? Isn't this the holy grail? And you know, after you grab the holy grail, is done. Well, you want to measure the amplitude to better, better precision. And um, given how big the gravitational wave amplitude is, uh, we're quickly sample variance limited with bicep two and Keck. So we just realized the two years of Keck data with five times bicep two receivers. We were just looking at the same thing over and over again. It's a great confirmation, but it doesn't reduce the error bar in R. <clears throat> so BICEP3 and Keck next year, we're definitely going to cover more sky, but only to an extent from South Pole. Uh, because you're at the South Pole, you can't really get below a certain elevation, which happens to be declination at the South Pole. 
So if you go to a mid-latitude site like Chile, the government is guy. Okay, so after bicep free, we're definitely going to Chile and other mid-latitude sites to uh, increase the sky coverage. So this is a new proposal called the Tensor Experiment, or Tensor, it's kind of childish. It's kind of my, my son's project, but, <laughs> but uh, at least the Tensor Experiment part is appropriate because we're trying to characterize, characterize Tensor uh, to greater precision. So we're going to not only measure the amplitude but to better precision, we want to measure the scale invariance, um, the angular dependence, if inflation really happened, it really ought to be scale independent, uh, scale invariant, okay? And uh, we want to measure the three-point function. You know, if you cover more sky, you can do it. And if you have a good theory that predicts a different three-point function for tensor, please publish your paper before you measure it. Um, and um, since we developed bicep three, this straight duplication uh, is a shovel-ready uh, project. Okay, so we just need more of the same thing to cover a larger patch of the sky. So there's great opportunity. It's low hanging fruit and uh, it's very low risk. So that's what I'm pushing. And the science return is unbelievable. Okay, just imagine shrinking the error bar of bicep two by a factor of three or four. You know, really picking out, you know, which of these models is the right one. And right now, it could be any of these, okay? Phi Q, you know, Xeon, monotropy, and so on. These are the postdocs and grad students, and the winter over by C2, across um, four or five institutes in the US. All right, I'll stop here and take questions. Charlene, on your um, yeah, several slides back, um, on your data showing the uh, more, uh, yes. So on the left side, uh, this uh, superimposed with your data, there's this dashed curve. And in the lowest mode, there's a bump. Yes. Yeah, and could you explain that? This, this, this one? Yeah, theoretically. So this is the uh, realization bump. So also generated from tensor. So the tensor fluctuation was still around when the universe was reionized <coughs> by all the stars. And redshift was 10. There was gravitational wave and scattering electrons. You tend to create B mode, and um, the angular angular diameter distance is much different. So it appears at a much larger scale. Actually, in general, we still work on this. Yes. What do you what do you expect? Uh, what do you expect uh prank to be as about the beam? So the sensitivity of Planck satellite uh, is um, comparable to bicep two. Okay, but it's the survey is spread across the entire sky. So in principle they can they could pick up um, <coughs> that's the same thing. But it's not going to be, you know, high signal to noise measurement of a map like this. It's going to be completely statistical, and they have to understand their systematics and noise level completely before they can do it. Uh, so um, a few months or a year, but it's going to be 